Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Technology, a podcast exploring the latest in computers, networking, home automation, mobile computing, and all things technology related. Our hosts will take a deeper dive into the latest and greatest in tech trends and give you the information you need to enable your tech-centric world. This is Insights into Technology, Episode 4, Secure Phones and Insecure Robots. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and this is the Tech News This Week. Coders seek easy, secure languages. Tech Republic tells us that in the latest Tayobi Programming Index update for October 2024, the programming landscape is seeing some significant developments. Python remains the dominant language, increasing its popularity from 20.17% in September to 21.9% in October. C++ and Java continue to hold strong in second and third place, respectively, showing modest growth. However, the real attention is on emerging languages, like Rust and Mojo, each showing promising trajectories. Rust, celebrated for its security and memory safety features, rose to the 13th spot on the index, signaling its growing adoption in response to the demand for languages that are secure, fast, and easy to learn. Meanwhile, Mojo, a new language combining aspects of Python and Swift, entered the top 50 in just one year. Its performance-focused design, particularly suited for AI hardware programming, makes it a language to watch for future growth. The programming community is keeping a close eye on alternatives to Python as the search for the do-it-all language intensifies. This signals notable shifts in the enterprise and commercial computing. Uh, even at our uh, my business, place of business, I have my developers tasked to actually take a look at these new languages here for security reasons. Uh, the, the main concern right now is memory leaks and memory management. And if you take a look at the uh, flurry of patches and fixes that we're getting from Microsoft each patch Tuesday of the month, you're finding a majority of these are use after and memory overflows and, and memory related issues that, you know, an operating system that's as old as Windows at this point in time, you would think would be mature enough to, to have those types of problems resolved by now. But a lot of applications are now running into issues with memory management. And I, you know, I think it's more a development style than anything else that leads to it. If you're not diligent in going in there and overwriting your registers and clearing them out and clearing out sensitive information, you're giving, first of all, you're bleeding data that, that you shouldn't be bleeding to, to other applications and other vectors. But you're also opening up the window for exploits to come in to uh, take advantage of these memory holes that you might have. Rust's ascent reflects the increased focus on security and memory safety, which are two critical areas for enterprises seeking to safeguard systems for vul from vulnerabilities while maintaining performance. Mojo's rapid rise carries a significant implication for industries leveraging AI and hardware optimization. <clears throat> we talk a lot about AI on the show here. Mojo blends the simplicity of Python with the speed of Swift, and it positions itself as a potential game changer for enterprises focused on AI, which is another initiative that we have in our wheelhouse right now that we're looking into. So anything that gives you that performance edge on computationally heavy things like artificial intelligence is going to give you a leg up. So we'll keep an eye on these moving forward and see where we wind up. And uh, we'll, we'll see who wins the race in, in this case here. Next up, we have an article from Bleeping Computer. 
They tell us uh, that Microsoft has deprecated PPTP and L2TP VPN protocols in Windows Server. Microsoft has announced the deprecation of the two longstanding VPN protocols in future versions of Windows Server, recommending a shift towards more secure protocols like secure socket tunneling or Internet Key Exchange version 2. These legacy protocols, meaning PPTP and L2TP, have been used for over 20 years and are now considered vulnerable to modern cybersecurity threats, with PPTP being susceptible to brute force attacks, and L2TP lacking encryption unless combined with another protocol like IPSEC. SSTP and IKEV2 are highlighted as stronger, more secure protocols offering advantages such as robust encryption, better performance, and improved reliability. SSTP is praised for its ease of use and ability to bypass firewalls, while IKEV2 is ideal for mobile users and delivers faster, more secure VPN connections. Microsoft has provided guidance for admins to transition smoothly, emphasizing that while these older protocols are deprecated, they will remain functional for a period to allow for gradual migration. Now, Microsoft's decision, decision to deprecate these legacy VPN protocols has really significant implications for enterprises and commercial computing, obviously in terms of security and performance, but these are VPN protocols that are widely deployed uh, across the enterprise space right now. Um, 20 years they've been in, in practice, and I remember 20 years ago was right around the time that people started taking uh, IPv6 seriously and the promise that IPv6 was going to have encryption built into it. You wouldn't need VPNs anymore. Well, that obviously hasn't come to pass in the last 20 years. So there's a lot of reliance, my company and every company that I've worked for for the last 30 years has been reliant on VPN protocols to some extent and PPTP and L2TP being the two primary ones. So this is going to be a significant shift. It's going to be an uplift. You're going to have to redeploy clients. You're going to have to have um, provisions to, to modify your firewalls. A um, <clears throat> couple of selling points on these new protocols. SSTP's ability to navigate firewalls easily. That's one plus. <laughs> IKEV2 <clears throat> has mobile-friendly features that provide stable connections during network changes make them attractive choices for businesses. So it's not just a matter of modernizing to, for the sake of modernizing or just to get uh, better security. They, these are definitely benefits, but there's performance issues that modern um, enterprise and commercial users will definitely benefit from. I know one of the biggest complaints that I've had over the history of using VPNs is the stability. You know, we used to be an overhead concern. You used to have high computation on your encryption. Processing strength has, has kind of ruled that out, but you've got a lot of activity that people use now for uh, ERP systems or CRM systems, or uh, even just remote desktop where there's, very little tolerance for network disruption, high latency, packet loss. And you're looking at protocols now that are more robust and capable of dealing with network rerouting and delays as a result of disruptions in the network. So there's huge benefits to moving to these newer protocols in addition to the security benefits. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on it's it's you know i i always criticize microsoft for not being particularly security focused and additionally they're not i mean we you look at your major uh security breaches out there and microsoft seem, seems to be at the forefront of it on a regular basis but at least they're taking a, a leading role now in trying to move forward with these newer vpn protocols and and that's a good thing we'll all benefit from that uh, our next story up keeps us in our political uh, arena here since it's election season. And this one comes to us from the register. The Trump campaign secures what they call unhackable phones. And I think that's about as dangerous as calling a ship 
unsinkable as the Titanic was. That's a that's a an interesting challenge to throw down for people. With the U.S. presidential election just weeks away, the Trump campaign has armed itself with what it claims are unhackable phones and computers provided by military kit supplier Green Hills Software. The move comes after pro-Iranian hackers previously infiltrated the campaign, stealing emails and sensitive data. Green Hills has equipped the team with devices running its ultra-secure integrity 178B operating system. Boy, that rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? Which is used in critical military assets like the F-22 and F-35 fighter jets. These systems, certified to the highest security assurance level, are said to be resistant to even sophisticated hacking attempts by those of the NSO of NSO Group's Pegasus spyware. CEO Dan O'Dowd boasts that the OS is highly secure with just 10,000 lines of meticulously reviewed code aiming at minimizing vulnerabilities. Although some cybersecurity experts remain skeptical, Green Hills asserts that its technology is crucial not only for campaigns but for securing election systems, highlighting the need for high-level security and safeguarding democratic processes. As the election draws closer, all eyes are on whether these these claims of unbreakable security hold true. Now, this obviously highlights the increase in need for security and more robust cybersecurity solutions for both home and commercial spaces. Uh, but ultimately, the problem comes down to the user. Uh, cybersecurity, no matter how much technology you throw at cybersecurity or software, hardware, whatever you want to do, the weakest link in the chain is still the end user. And if your end users are not practicing proper cybersecurity hygiene, it doesn't matter what you're going to throw at them. They tell us that as cyber attacks become more sophisticated, particularly in politically sensitive environments, the demand for secure systems grows. It seems like every other week we have some kind of breach, cybersecurity breach from a campaign or national convention or, or whatever. The fact that military-grade technology originally developed for fighter jets and bombers is being employed for election security reflects a heightened awareness of vulnerabilities in political campaigns and critical infrastructure. Now, the fact that this is being employed by a, the challenger and not the incumbent goes back to the complaints that I've had in the past in which the federal government just is not taking this stuff particularly seriously. They seem to be very set in their ways. They're very slow to respond. Um, they lack the, uh, the flexibility and the agility to move quickly and handle cybersecurity threats at the pace at which the attackers are coming at them. Uh, the fact that this is being done essentially by a private citizen in, in Trump suggests that, you know, they're obviously a little bit more on top of things here than the federal government is. They say no system is truly unhackable and claims of invul un invulnerability can serve as a challenge to skilled hackers. And I think you're going to find a lot of people accept this challenge. Commercial entities using this kind of technology which they aren't, by the way. The, the security, the software that Green Hills produces is not commercially available. Um, but the technology must remain vigilant. Users must remain vigilant with it. Uh, and even the most secure systems require constant updates and monitoring. Uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with Green Hills myself. I don't deal with them on uh, a professional or a personal basis. So I can't really vouch for what their significant capabilities are. However, if they're making software for stealth fighters for the military, I have to assume that they know what they're doing. So hopefully people will see this type of uh, news and they'll take a little bit more seriously. And eventually, as with most things in the government sector, this type of technology will eventually trickle down to end users. Because really, there's no reason why everyone shouldn't be more concerned with cybersecurity when it comes to their developments. 
So we'll keep an eye on that story and see where it goes. Uh, I'm going to take a little break here, but before we do that, I want to take a moment to uh, thank our users, our, our viewers, and our listeners. If you don't already do so, please subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio and video versions of all of our podcasts listed as Insights into Things. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast. We would also invite you to uh, contact us, give us your thoughts, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can also call in, leave a message on our voicemail, and uh, if you'd like, we can get you up on one of our shows here. Uh, the phone number to call into is 856-403-8788. That's 856-403-8788. Call Give us your feedback, your message. Uh, if you want to be on the show, let us know what show you want to be on. And uh, obviously, you know, we're family friendly here. Please keep it, uh, keep that in mind. Once again, that number is 856-403-8788. Uh, you can also get links to all this and much more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Technology. We are talking tech news today. Next up is an article we have from The Record. National Public Data Files for Bankruptcy, citing fallout from cyber attack. In a significant development, National Public Data, a major background check company, has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy following the fallout from a massive cyber attack. The breach, which occurred in late December of 2023, exposed millions of Social Security numbers and other personal data, leading to several state-level investigations, class action lawsuits, and federal scrutiny. The stolen information was sold on the dark web, intensifying the legal and financial challenges for the company. National Public Data, which serves sectors like healthcare, admitted that the breach severely impacted its reputation and revenue, driving away customers. With claims from nearly all U.S. states and territories, the company stated that it cannot generate enough revenue to address liabilities or defend against lawsuits. The incident underscores the growing risks company fi companies face from cyber attacks and the potential for catastrophic fallout especially in data-heavy industries like background checks. Now, the issue that I really take with this one is these companies have been around for quite some time now. They're used for credit checks. They're used for background checks. They are a clearinghouse for information. And it's our information. They collect it from multiple sources they compile it into a database, and then they sell access to it to various sources. And the problem is, is that it's been known for an exceedingly long time how sensitive this data is, how dangerous this data can be in the wrong hands, and the protections surrounding this have had almost no 
regulation whatsoever. Now, yeah, I'm I'm the I'm the guy who complains about unfunded government mandates and excessive regulation and all that stuff. And that's all true. But in this case here, this is almost like a private company holding the nuclear launch codes and not having any security around it. It's monumental irresponsible how they handle this, how they protected all of that data. Just the the fact that these these data brokers exist, I think, is is almost criminal in in what they do. But the fact that they have no security protocols in place to protect this data, this is like having all of your gold in Fort Knox and leaving the front door open. Somebody's going to bound to walk in and, and steal it. And this is exactly what happened here. It, it was such a ripe target. It's amazing that they haven't been hit prior to this. And the breach was so huge and so complete that it, it defines definition. I mean, they're talking 2 billion people. They're, they're estimating that their information has been released. Now, granted, a good chunk of those people are probably deceased at this point in time, but it pretty much is every person in the country, at least, and probably many other countries as well. And they're going to file for bankruptcy for this. So they they grossly mishandle this information. They've made, Lord knows how much, millions, probably billions of dollars over the years off of our data. Then it gets released. So they're going to file for bankruptcy. And what happens to the users? So the user's information is out there. You don't even get the... the. Uh, Ubiqu the ubiquitous per, uh, personal information protection, your credit monitoring. That's usually what happens when a breach like this occurs. You get a breach like this, they'll give you a year's worth of credit monitoring, and then that's it. They're not held accountable for anything. And that's what the most disturbing thing is here. They're not the only, they're the largest, or we're the largest data broker out there, but they're not the only one. And other companies are still collecting this kind of information and very likely doing so in an, an equally insecure manner. And now this company is going to face no consequences whatsoever to releasing this information in which people's, you've got people's lives that are being ruined by this. Their credit's being ruined. People are taking out loans. They're buying cars. They're stealing their identity. And the the inconvenience and stress and difficulty the financial difficulty of trying to bounce back from that is astronomical and yet this company is going to be let off scot free file for chapter 11 bankruptcy this division of this you know multinational conglomeration is probably going to go away and be an inconvenience and then they're going to spring up another one that's not liable anymore and, and they're going to start doing it all over again. I think we need as a, as a rule of thumb, we need to have much more control over our personal data, the compensation and, and companies, you look at Europe, Europe seems to be taking a much more hardline stance on privacy and they have extremely heavy financial penalties but those financial penalties don't go back to the people. That goes to the government. I think what happens when you have something like this, you're going to wind up in a class action lawsuit. They'll settle that lawsuit for a couple of million dollars. The lawyers get 90% of the money, and they're going to trickle out a $4 check to you at some point in time in the next six years. And that's ridiculous. That's, that's just not fair the way that works out. So I think this is one area where we need to have more government regulation. It, these types of things should fall under banking regulations and banking security because that's exactly what this is for. And that's the direct impact on this is people's financials. So we need to do better when it comes to this type of thing. Uh, next up, we have kind of a head scratcher one here this one comes to us from the verge um robot vacuum cleaners have gone rogue apparently hackers recently exploited the vulnerability 
in Ecovax DBOT X2 Omni robotic vacuums across several U.S. cities, commandeering the devices to harass homeowners and pets. According to an ABC News report, hackers gained control of these smart vacuums using their speakers to shout slurs and frighten animals. The incidents, which occurred in May, prompted the company to identify the attack as, quote, credential stuffing event, where attackers likely use stolen login credentials. Ecovax assured customers that no personal data had been compromised and blocked the attacker's IP address, while also committing to further security updates. This case highlights ongoing concerns about the security of smart home devices which often require persistent internet connections. Researchers have previously flagged vulnerabilities in the DBOT X2, emphasizing the need for stronger protections in smart device ecosystems to prevent such abuses. Now, I kind of giggle at this, and I probably shouldn't. It is a serious issue. I I just, we have a, a robot vacuum here, and I can, I can only imagine it driving around my base, my, family room chasing my cats yelling obscenities at it and I, I, I just can't help but laugh at that uh, but this is a serious serious threat um it's it, it this highlights another issue that we have where as a society we have embraced these internet of things devices what am i talking about with internet of things so light bulbs and smart outlets and smart TVs and washing machines and cameras and smart lights and smart uh, power strips. We've become so dependent on these interconnected devices without really understanding the implications of them. Uh, You just set up a camera outside, an IP-based camera outside to monitor your driveway to see if someone's messing with your car. And that sits on your network and that device becomes a point of vulnerability for you. You see nowadays with computers and with your phones, you're getting regular updates, security updates, constantly trickling out to all of your devices. Well, the problem with Internet of Things devices is you've got devices that don't get updates. There aren't any requirements right now legally to force updates to these And you essentially have devices that are sitting on your network that have holes in them already security-wise. And people are finding these security holes. They're exploiting them. They're getting into your network. Uh, Yeah, they're they're taking over stuff. You've got privacy concerns when it comes to cameras and so forth. But what you have are massive botnets that are being taken over by usurping these Internet of Things devices that are then used to create massive botnets to go out and uh, exploit more vulnerabilities. And a lot of people don't realize your smart home device, your smart speakers are vulnerable. They are listening to you. They have cameras on them in some cases. Uh, These are all things that expose your network to the outside world. It's no different then if you took a an Ethernet and you plugged it into your network and just rolled it out and put it on the the front lawn and let anybody and their brother come through and plug into it, as soon as they connect in and they compromise one of these devices, um, you're vulnerable. They're on your network. They're attacking your network. They're seeping. They're leaking data from your network and they're taking over other devices and they're embedding themselves in your in your network. So people need to, you know, if you're, I'm not, I'm a big advocate of Internet of Things devices. My entire house has them. So I'm certainly not going to tell people not to use the technology. But all of my Internet of Things devices operate on an isolated network with a secondary Internet connection that never even touches my network. It goes straight out. That's, that's where my guest Wi-Fi network is as well. So I have complete network isolation from my IoT network uh, between that and my my internal home network. So even if they compromise one of those devices, they can't get to my network. I just have to take that device offline 
But you have to keep an eye on these things and you have to keep them updated. Uh, most of these devices do have update functions to them. They just don't do them automatically. Uh, but you know, this this might be the start of Skynet and the the rise of the machines here with angry vacuum cleaner bots screaming obscenities at cats. It's just an odd story that I thought was an interesting one to talk about. And the last story we have today uh, for this week is um, kind of one that touched home for me. I am an old school BBS person myself. I used to run one. I used to uh, live off of BBSs before the internet came around. And uh, this one is about uh, BBS inventor and architect of our online age dying at 78. This comes from Ars Technica. Ward Christensen, the co-inventor of the sci a computer bulletin board system, or BBS, and a pivotal figure in early digital culture has passed away at age 78. Alongside Randy Seuss, Christensen launched the first BBS in 1978, sparking a revolution in online community building that paved the way for the internet as we know it today. This system allowed computer users to dial into a machine, exchange messages, share files, and basically laid the foundation for multiplayer online gaming and the rise of shareware gaming in the 1980s and 90s. Despite his monumental contributions to the digital age, Christensen remained humble throughout his life, intent with a long career at IBM and never seeking the spotlight. His work with Seuss included the development of the X modem file transfer protocol, inspired countless others to build their own BBS platforms, creating a vibrant pre-internet online ecosystem. As we look back on his life, Christensen's legacy of openness, innovation, and humility remains a cornerstone of the digital world he helped create. Uh, sad to say it, but... I guess uh, a lot of the early pioneers are getting to this point now where we're going to start losing them. Uh, as I said, I was a, a BBSer myself. I started out, I had a friend of mine get me into it. I worked at Radio Shack, actually, uh, in my local town for a while. We ran a BBS out of there, and we used it to kind of promote sales and, and, and pricing and specials and stuff like that. And... Uh, I, I then went from there to host one myself and have fond memories of some of the uh, friends that I made from that, that community back in the, I was back in the days of computer shows and we'd go to the uh, Garden State racetrack down here in South Jersey for these huge computer shows and meet other BBS people here. So that was a very fun period of my life. Uh, we're going to take our last break here, and then uh, we're going to have a discussion with uh, a dear friend of mine who is a tech luminary. We'll be right back. Are you tired of your favorite gaming podcast finishing with a play? Oh, no! Well, check out No Credits Rolled where we play the games but rarely finish them. How's it going, folks? I'm Sam Whalen, your friendly host at No Credits Rolled, the ultimate gaming podcast, where we dish out the latest scoops and reviews on all your beloved video games. Hey, listen! Not only that, but we spice things up with some guest interviews and even give you, yes, you, a chance to have your say. Tune in every other week for a fresh dose of No Credits Rolled, available on all major podcast platforms, and hit us up on social media at No Credits Rolled. So why wait? Let's dive into the gaming world together, where finishing games is optional, but the fun is guaranteed. As often happens with the podcast... We did encounter some technical difficulties in the early portion of our interview with Howard Dorch, and I lost about the first 10 minutes. So I apologize for that. Uh, I did have a very touching and very appropriate intro that I had for him that I thought I had recorded, and apparently did not. 
Um, so I'd like to introduce to you a good friend of mine. I've known him for about 10 years now. We actually met in a gaming forum. Um, he was part of a guild that I ran in Star Wars The Old Republic MMO. Howard is uh, presently retired. He is a former uh, developer for Sony Online Entertainment. Uh, was involved with EverQuest. Then he worked for AMD on the Athlon processor. He was a, a member of the do design team for that. He's done a lot of different things. He's worked with lasers for the military that eventually became the Miles training gear that they use. Uh, he's run his own development company, uh, Hypercat Games, uh, and he's been a uh, educator at a university for video game development. He is a well-rounded, Renaissance-style man. He is a font of knowledge, and uh, every discussion that I have with Howard is a educational and entertaining experience and i wanted to take an opportunity to share some of that vast knowledge of his with our audience so with no further ado i would like to introduce to you howard dorch i flew to ohio told the wife we're selling the house i'm moving to san diego and if you want to come back up to cats and let's go <laughs> so they put me up in the marriott and uh you know, I stayed there and optimized game code for them. That's incredible. <laughs> so, yeah, well, and yeah, go. So, so I, I just want to take a step back real quick and talk about the, the, the laser work that you did. So, yeah. so the work that you had done for the military, that eventually basically becomes the commercial version of laser tag. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah. you know, just to see that transformation, have you had that experience with anything else that you worked on where you worked on it in one environment for one purpose, and then it turned into something completely different in the commercial realm? I'd have to think about that. Um, nothing, nothing really comes to mind. I mean, like everything you do, um, you know, just seems to wind up somehow in a, in a commercial environment. I, um, once upon a time, I, I took a, um, I'm trying to remember the code base now, but it was the one for the, uh, oh, the, uh, game console. What was the Atari? The 2600? Yeah, yeah, the Atari. Um, you know, that was that was uh, something that, you know, they had like EPROMs in them and people could pop the EPROMs out and, and uh, reprogram or program different ones and put them back in. Um, so basically what I did was I took that that particular code and I put it inside of a, of a video game as a... Um, uh, as a task, you know, it was a multitask. So basically I could, I could drive whatever that console could do. I could drive it from within a video game. So anything that you wanted, you know, to, to have happen, uh, I had a, an overriding video code that was doing it. So, you know, like I could put a game within a game kind of a thing. That's cool. Uh, I don't know if that ever went anywhere. Well, didn't but, you, um, you did something for um, uh, Mars exploration. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, a friend talk of about mine, that. Yeah. A friend of mine, um, uh, Dennis Beller is his name. He did the uh, interferometer work for the uh, Mars, Mars exploration mission. And um, uh, so basically this satellite would fly around Mars and fire a laser down at the surface and the reflection from the surface, they could get an elevation. In other words, they could get a 3D map of the of the surface. And um, what we call lidar sorry. today. Yeah, it's lidar today. Yeah, exactly. And so um, the uh, the guys that did like um, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, 
that kind of a rover system. The uh, code base for that, it was done on a, uh, I believe it was a RAD 6000 processor. And uh, so what we could do is we could take the Mars elevation data and create a, a landscape. And here's a rover that, um, you know, if you wanted to program the rover from the Earth, uh, you would send it a command, you know, turn turn your front wheels 10 degrees left or 10 degrees right or whatever, roll forward three revolutions, that kind of a thing. So um, uh, what I did was I put that code uh, inside of a video game. They built a rover, you know, a, a 3D model of a rover, and they could drive it around in Mars using the code that they would actually use uh, would have to send to Mars for the actual rover. Of course, the round trip time for that was like 20 minutes or so. You know, they, they'd issue a command, then 20 minutes later, the rover would do something. And um, then their camera, they get a 20 minute signal back so they could see if the rover actually made the move and which direction it was facing. Is there a rock or that kind of thing? So, uh, yeah, the uh, the uh, programmers, the people that were actually driving the rover, could pre-program it on a in a computer game. So you know, here's a computer game with the with the real landscape data from from Mars, and uh, they could drive the rover around. Let's see if it goes forward. Let's see, you know, take it to the edge of a crater, or there's a rock there. Let's see how we can get around the rock, or, or that kind of a thing. And from that knowledge, then they could go and send the actual commands to rovers on Mars. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize Which, it was that involved in in the actual day-to-day operation of yeah. the rover itself. That's that's well, pretty crazy. You know, you, yeah, you got a you got a billion dollars worth of equipment sitting two hundred thousand miles away. And um you don't want to let Howard Wallowitz drive it around and <laughs> run it off a cliff, ditch, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. So uh, uh, they were they were very meticulous on, you know, how much, how far. You know, when they could see that they had ten feet to go, or twenty feet, or a hundred feet, they could they could go ahead and and drive it that far. But you know, like some of the things that happened to it was it got out in the middle of a sand trap that they couldn't see, you know, it's just a flat piece of land to them, but it it went out 10 or 20 feet and got bogged down in a sand trap. Mm. So they wanted to move it a little bit, check, check its status, move it a little bit more and check its status. And if you look at the, um, the uh, path of, of spirit and opportunity, I mean, there's a, there's a wonderful, video about that uh, from Discovery, I think, Discovery Channel, uh, about spirit and opportunity and its lifetime and how they had to park it on a hill to have its uh, solar panels facing towards the sun Mm -hmm. during the winter months, that kind of thing. I mean, if you you are interested at all in that kind of a thing, watch those shows. Those are fantastic. Interesting. But, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, and so... By by saying that, now, what have we developed from that? We've got robotic systems now that a doctor on on the Earth, right, can perform a surgery on a space station. Right, right. That's the that's the end result. You know, it's how do you how do you remote control something uh, in in as virtual real time as you can? You know, Mars is a 20 minute trip. But, you know, to the space station is almost instantaneous. Right. And that's really, but, that's the thing that, it, that it, it, technology itself amazes me how it can evolve from, from these things. But looking at, at the things that you've done in your career and seeing how the things that you did in the early part of your career and where they've come now, I find that just fascinating at the, at the level of contributions that you've provided over the the span of your career and and where things are now. So you started developing for video games in Sony. Where did that go? What course did that wind up taking for you? Well, um, 
after after I started working at Sony, you know, of course, we did a, a game called EverQuest, and um, EverQuest uh, that was that was a, a technology nightmare at the at that point in time when EverQuest was being developed. Um, you had a uh, a uh, software rendering engine. So you start off with a software rendering engine. And then Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, comes out with a thing called DirectX 3. I think it was 3 when it started. So now, all of a sudden, they have hardware transformation and lighting. And then a company, uh, I can't remember who did the Voodoo cards. Do you remember? Oh, no. Actually, I don't. But it's funny. I had a note in here to talk about something else with that. But... I don't want yeah, to go. Well, I don't want to take you off topic. So, so here comes the voodoo card. You know, all of a sudden now we have video cards. It was the game industry had actually driven technology, where we need more horsepower. We need uh, we need better graphics. We need uh, more colors, more depth of field, more, 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 more. Right. So the video card companies, Nvidia and uh, uh, ATI. Uh, went to town and they, they, I mean, they were working 24 seven trying to develop the next video card that everybody in the world was going to buy. Uh, when the uh, voodoo, the first voodoo card came out, everybody had to have one. I mean, mm -hmm. you just had to have a voodoo card because all these games now were being written for the voodoo card. Well, the problem for me, code base is I've got a software rendering engine, and now I've got DirectX, which means I have to have create another code path for uh, DirectX 3 to do hardware transformation and lighting. And then the Voodoo cards uh, had, a, uh, had a different language altogether that it used. So you, if you had, a, you had to check to see if there was a Voodoo card installed, if there was a voodoo card there, then you had to use, I think it was the language is called Glide. And uh, so you had to go down the Glide path. If you had a video card in there that understood uh, hardware transformation and lighting, you had to code it down that path. And if you didn't have either one, you had to switch over to the software render. So, I mean... Picture the code mess that was <laughs> trying to figure out what you had, where you were going, what you were doing. And then, you know, we started off the world with 300 baud modems. Yep. And then it went to 1,200 baud modems. And, oh, my God, you had to have a – which was the next one? 56K, I think. 20, 24. Uh, you went from 12 to 24 to 56. Yeah. So – you know, now we're fighting. Now we're fighting the the transport across the internet. So I've got I've got three different code paths to look at. The the optimization of transporting a world of data across across the internet uh, from client to server back to other clients. And uh, you know, so what kind of modem do you have? What kind of video card do you mm -hmm. have? And here comes AMD with a um, a uh, K6 processor. Oh, I love the K6s. The K6 processor now had its own special language that it could speak. So, all right, another thing in the pile of, of wonderment. <laughs> so, trying to trying to code, take advantage of the the k6 special code base and all these other things that were happening you know the the magic was a a uh, direct x3 card that had hardware transformation and lighting and a k6 processor if you had that i could get your frame rate way up right because well and I you were also that. you were also dealing with variables like compression over the modem uh, bit yeah. loss over the modem. I mean, nobody ever got 24K out of a 24K modem unless you were on like ISDN lines. They were, you know, you just you just got dirty noise across the line. So you had to deal with packet loss and everything else with 
with all of your networking protocol. So I had, it had to have added additional levels of complexity for you. Well, it wasn't so much. Um, it, yeah, I agree the the complexity, but, you know, picture in your mind, you had to outthink the, the hardware. You had to actually outthink the hardware and the software. You, most of the world sees a circle as 360 degrees, right? The world, yes, I agree. Yeah, every everybody's you know 360 degrees. So you've got a character standing in a 3D world, and uh, the character is aimed at some angle within that 360 degrees. Well, if you look at uh, binary or hexadecimal code, 360 winds up. You have to use 16 bits of of uh, data. So now I'm I'm having to transport 16 bits of data across the internet to tell the server what direction my character is facing. So let's rethink that a little bit. Let's say that we divided a circle up into zero to 255. That's a byte. That's eight bits. You know, it doesn't really matter in a video game if I'm looking at 349.3 degrees or 350, right? right. I mean, right. it just doesn't really matter because everybody else in the world that sees your character in this in this virtual world is going to see you uh, looking some direction and then turn 10 or so degrees off in another direction. It's not going to really affect the game. It's not really going to matter. But the thing it did for us was instead of send, sending 16 bits across the network, now I'm sending eight. Mm. I just doubled the throughput. Yeah, yeah. Just doubled it right off the bat. Right. So so we had to look at tricks like that. Random number generators. You know, it takes quite a bit to do a, a to calculate a random number. So rather than do that, we pre-calculated a, a whole bunch of random numbers, pre-calculated and put them in a in a uh, an array, a giant array. Mm-hmm. And then we had a counter. So when I needed a random event, like in the in the game, I just say, well, my index is 34. I just indexed into that array th- the 34th, and I pulled out a random number. Now, there were some arrays that I needed a random number from 0 to 100. Some of them I needed a 0 to 1,000. So I just created an array of, of random numbers when the game fired up. Um, mostly like on the servers when the when the servers needed a bunch of uh, random numbers to be generated to, you know during a boss fight or whatever, they would pre-calculate all those. And then every 10 or 15 minutes, there would be another set of arrays being calculated, and then the first set would just be dropped and we'd go to the second set. So it was almost uh, a perfect, random number generator that didn't cost any processor time. Right. It was just a simple lookup table. Right. So like I said, we had to we had to get real inventive when it came to that. And you look at the uh transcendental math libraries, sines, cosines, tangents, that kind of thing. When Kernigan and Ritchie, the the uh C C libraries, when when they put all that together, they did it the hardest possible way they could do it, you know? And so if you go back in and figure out how to calculate a sine or a cosine or, um, you know, vector, vector math, um, matrix multiply. Need a second. <clears throat> you get a, like a matrix multiply where you have to do a, a four, four, four by four times a four by four. So, we had to go optimize all those kinds of things and uh, make the game work. In other words, we kind of went outside of the box, if you will. You know, this is this is what the code says you're supposed to do, but we see a better way to do it. And that was the optimization part. Interesting. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had your brain sweat? <laughs> yeah. 
brain sweat is what I call it. Sweat so, equity. So other than than the actual software evolved <laughs> with uh, video games and stuff like that, you've done you've done hardware computational hardware work too. You worked on some processors, didn't you? Well, when the uh, Sony was going to release EverQuest, it was, you know, bound and determined to have that one out there on the market. Um, the company, uh, AMD, found out that I was the person that was optimizing the game for the K6 processor. And uh, so what happened was uh, one of the guys from AMD contacted me directly at Sony and said, if you're looking for a job, uh, we have a home for you here in Austin, Texas. So, uh, you know, uh, Sony was going to launch EverQuest. And so all of the people that they had to hire in order to make this thing work, it was about to be released. So they were looking at, at laying people off. So it looked like, uh, okay, I was probably not needed anymore because the game engine was running. And uh, so I, I told him that I'd come for an interview and I flew to Austin, Texas on their dime and uh, interviewed for uh, AMD. And at that particular time, they were closing out the K6 and, and it was the beginning of the Athlon. That's all we had for this week, folks. Uh, before we do go, I want to take a chance uh, once again to invite those of you who don't already subscribe to the podcast to do so. You can find us listed as Insights into Things. You can find both audio and video versions of our podcasts online at that. And you can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, anywhere you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite you to uh, reach out to us. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. Let us know how we're doing. Give us your show suggestions. Uh, if you'd like to appear on the show, feel free to give us a call, leave a message. You can reach us at 856-403-8788. That's 856-403-8788. If you'd like to have your comments on the show, just let us know which show you'd like to be on and uh, keep it uh, family friendly for us and, and preferably topic relevant. Again, that number is 856-403-8788. You can also find high res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. You can find audio versions. I'm sorry. You can find uh, find us on Facebook at uh, uh, facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We are on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Uh, if you do have a, if you're an Amazon prime subscriber, you do get a free monthly Twitch prime subscription to get through that our way. We'd appreciate it. You can also find all this and more on our official website at insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. 